I was not the one that had these kills. You were at his house. Yes, sir. I'm the murderer. Oh, oh there. God. Do you know exactly when he was killed? Yes, sir, I know. You were there when he was killed. No, sir, I was not at his house. Oh, oh, damn, it's not. Sir, I can't. This is a guy who's Oh my God, and the only reason he would be bringing that device over to that home would be for the purpose of using it as a weapon. He wasn't going over there to cook. He wasn't going over there to grill. Um, he went over there and the first thing that he did once he got inside the house was club Rupert Anderson over the head with that spatula mul multiple times. Did I forget to tell you that when you tried logging off with the camera system, it didn't actually log you off and put you in that privacy mode? It kept recording. Yeah, it did. Some criminals are a lot less cunning and sneaky than they think they are. Sometimes they come up with elaborate plans to get away with their crimes and totally think that everyone is just going to believe their lies and they'll get away with everything, no problem. But most of the time, law enforcement is not so easily fooled. And most of the time, it is the criminal who ends up getting caught and looking like an idiot. These are the stories of three twisted killers who thought they could get away with murder by lying and pretending to be witnesses. Spoiler alert, it doesn't go well for them. You to get with it, Sir, what do you want me? I'll tell you, you tell anything. I don't know what happened. What? Oh my God. What are you telling me? Well, there's nothing I'm not telling you. I did not kill Brad. I did not kill Brad. Did your wife kill Brad? Oh my God, no. What you're watching here is a guy who is trying to pretend like he is totally an innocent bystander in a horrible murder. But in reality, he is the killer. What the hell's going on? Oh! <laughs> Oh my god, this is all coming down yeah. on me now. Well, cause you did it! Oh sir, I did not kill my Best <laughs> On May 7th of 2017, David Kinney made a startling 911 call. He had just discovered his friend, Brad McGarry, died in the basement. David had come to his friend's house with his wife, Sherry, to drop off a weed whacker that Brad had wanted to borrow. But when they arrived at the house, David said they found the door ajar and immediately thought something could be wrong. It was then that he found Brad's body. Brad appeared to have died after being fired at. David's wife Sherry spoke to the dispatcher on the 911 call. She appeared very distressed and in total shock. Okay, what's going on? I don't even know. You don't know what's, what's going, going on? on? Is he breathing? Oh my god. My husband's my, 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 my dead. Okay, is that your husband? My husband's freaking out. Yes, and okay. my friend. Sherry is concerned about getting her young daughter Elizabeth away from the crime scene before she sees the body. Meanwhile, you can hear yelling and commotion going on in the background that seems to be coming from David. She's on the floor. There's blood everywhere. Oh my god, he has a soft blood in the back of his head. What is your name? My name is Sherry Kinney. Sherry. You don't see a gun? No, I don't see a gun. Okay. Listen, I need you and your husband to back out of the residence and wait outside for the officers. Do you okay. hear me? Sorry. Law enforcement arrived at the scene quickly and determined that Brad was, in fact, dead. News of the murder shocked the community. Who could have done something like this? As investigators took a closer look at Brad and his life, they found some interesting information. Brad was an openly gay man. Unfortunately, at the time, where he was living in Bel Air, Ohio, there was still a lot of homophobia around. This sadly made life difficult for Brad, but still, who would have hated him enough to actually take his life? It wasn't until detectives began interviewing Brad's family members, particularly one of his cousins, that some things began to piece together. Sunday, we went to Grammy's. We were sitting around the table, which is me and Brad and Heather, which is another cousin of mine, and he made a comment how this DJ guy, he was coming over. Brad's intent was it was romantic. So who was this DJ guy? He made a joke about taking a nap, and it wasn't taking a nap. It, he was insinuating that they were having sex. It was like quotation marks. This was Sunday. This was Sunday. he was killed. Yes. Obviously, this person who Brad had been planning to see on the day of his death was now the number one person of interest, but they still needed to find out DJ's true identity. What time do you leave? Between 1.30 and 2, 
really. Yes, he was supposed to. Sure he was dropping all the tuxes off. I also know that he was very married. Told you that. Uh, Brad did. Brad told you. Yeah, she being the wife didn't know all this time. They've been doing this for years. This is getting more and more dramatic by the minute. Not only was Brad seeing someone in secret, but it was a man who appeared to be keeping the fact that he was gay from everyone, including his own wife. From what I understand, the two of them, Brad and DJ, kind of, I don't know if they laid low or they completely broke up. I guess they call him DJ or David Kenny. Really? Yes, the only guy. Because it's the only guy he's ever told me about. It's just, it's the guy, that's him. The case had suddenly been blown wide open. They now had the name of the guy who was likely the last person to see Brad alive and possibly the person who killed him. The next step was to look into David Kinney and bring him in for questioning. On the day that David had supposedly discovered Brad's body, David had snapped photos around the house that he wanted to show law enforcement as evidence. Detectives had asked to borrow David's phone, telling them that they were going to look at the photos. But actually, they were doing something completely different. They wanted to track the location of David's phone to see where he was leading up to when they believed that Brad's murder happened. It was immediately clear that David had been trying to cover his tracks. He had deleted all the text messages that he and Brad had shared, but when it came to technology nowadays, nothing you put out there is really gone forever. Law enforcement were able to recover the text and read them, and they proved something pretty shocking. David and Brad appeared to have been in a very serious romantic relationship. Not not only that, but the phone showed proof that David had been at Brad's home when the murder was believed to have taken place. Now they're going to confront David with this evidence and see what he has to say about it. I was not telling when Brad was killed. You were at his house. Yes, sir. I'm the murderer. Oh, oh God. God. You know exactly when he was killed. Yes, sir, I know. Right there when he was killed. No, sir, I was not at his house when that man was murdered. Sir, I can't. This is the guy she Oh my God, I know. David seemed to be getting more and more upset by the minute. It was all his lies that were unraveling right in front of his eyes, and he was starting to realize that he wasn't going to be able to talk his way out of this one. In order to try to get him to tell the truth, the detective started talking to David about everything that he would lose if he kept lying. I'll lose everything, lose your wife, lose your kids. This don't have to be good. 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 The detective's words seemed to get to David. Is he ready to finally tell the truth about what happened, or is he just going to tell more lies? He said, yeah. There's another guy. I don't know who he was, and I don't know his name. I swear on everything. What happened next? He went in the garage. It's okay. Oh. David covers his face with his hands as he begins to cry. There are a lot of things that aren't adding up here. If this is the truth, then why didn't David just tell law enforcement this from the beginning? There's a couple of things you need to know. Brad's front seat, the beamer was full stop that he broke the wagon. Yes, sir. He didn't have a passenger. Sir, that guy went back into the BMW. Basically, what the detective is trying to tell David is that he doesn't believe there was another man there when Brad was killed. It had just been David and Brad alone, and David has been lying this whole time. If you pay attention to David's body language, it isn't hard to tell that he isn't telling the truth. Not only is he crying with seemingly not a tear in sight, but he keeps covering his face so he doesn't have to look the detective in the face. Get to the house. Well, I'm telling you the God on the streets of love. There was another man there. Right. I, I swear to you, God, I do not know his name. I do not know his name. But he did kind of have a little bit of an argument. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what happened. David continues on with his elaborate story, faking tears the whole time. Oh, you 
Jesus. And he was no sh**. But I'm not scared. I don't know what to do. And then I left. Oh. David is trying to play the victim here. He just keeps going on and on about how he was so terrified and didn't know what to do. But the detective is about to try and explain to him just how crazy his story actually sounds. Things are about to get heated. He knew, he knew what I looked like. He, 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 I, my vehicle was there. I did what not know what to do. What kind of gun was it? I have no clue. Why did you call the cops? Why did you do this elaborate story? Why did you put you put your own daughter in that basement with that boss? You did that. Yes, sir. The detective is tired of playing Mr. Nice Guy. He's getting angry and about to try a different approach in hopes of getting David to spill his guts. And you knew he was down there. She put your family. Sir, I am tell me what happened. I did not kill him. You knew Brad was dead? It seems like David is shutting down, so this expert investigator is going to try a different technique. He wants to gain David's trust and make him feel as if he's on his side. If he can get in his head, he may convince David to finally tell the truth. I think that maybe somebody was around. I still didn't think anybody believed me. David seems to be listening intently to the detective's made up theory, but is he going to take the bait? Was it an accident? Am I right? Drop, drop all this shit and just let it out. You, Brad deserves it. Brad's family deserves it. Your wife deserves it. Your kids deserve it. David finally shares a little bit of a glimpse into his affair with Brad. Brad doesn't want me to leave my wife for a while. I love my wife and kids to death. You love Brad too? I do, I mean. And sometimes you think about leaving your wife for him? Okay, I'm told him when it's time to leave my So Brad wanted David to leave his wife to be with him, but David refused. Could this have caused a fight to break out between them and somehow led to Brad's murder? He smacked me around a couple times. He said, Did you end all of this now? I'm, I'm done with you forever. Got real loud with me. You know, kind of like up in my face. He had a. Those little. Derringers. What he is referring to here is a deadly weapon. Cross the line, man. Stop. Look at me. Let it go. Tell me what happened next. He had it in his hand. Just kind of like waving at me, you know what I mean? Okay. Telling me, you know, you're f up. I'm tired of you. I can't believe my emotions this long and just to call it quits. He kept waving at me, so I grabbed it. Okay. What happened after you grabbed it? I pushed him. Okay. What happened? David takes a long pause here. This could be because he is trying to quickly come up with his next lie in his head. Finally, David has confessed to killing Brad. He is arrested and charged with murder, but later pleads not guilty. His trial drew a lot of media attention. What kind of monster could kill his best friend and loved one in cold blood, and why did he do it? David was convicted of Brad's murder in February 2018. The judge had this to say about David's heartless actions. If this man was able to do a assassin's job to someone he loved and his best friend, what could he do to his enemy or someone who opposed him? Brad never gave a reason for why he did what he did, but he did offer an apology to Brad's family while in court. I would like to apologize to the Gary family for all the hurt and pain that I put you through and prevent for any of this to happen, and I wish you could all, I could take it all back. I know all the apologies in the world will never bring him back, but I want you to know I truly am sorry for it all. Finally, it was time for David to learn his fate. The defendant shall serve life in prison 
without the possibility of parole. Why do you think David killed Brad? Could it have been because David didn't want anyone to know he was gay? Could Brad have threatened to expose the truth to David's wife? Let us know what you think in the comments. On January 2nd of 2020, a woman named Nikki Sue Ensel of North Dakota made a frantic 911 call to report that she had returned home to discover that her house was on fire. She said she hadn't talked to her husband, Chad Ensel, in a few days, and she was worried that he could be inside the home. Firefighters arrived at the scene quickly, and when they went inside the home, they discovered Chad's dead body. He was lying on the ground with a deadly weapon next to him. All signs seemed to point that he had taken his own life. But there were some pretty suspicious circumstances leading up to Chad's death. He hadn't been at work in days, and Nikki had called his boss to say that he was sick with the flu. But after several days passed, and still nobody had seen or heard from him, some of his coworkers started to get worried. But that's not all. Only two days had passed since Chad had been found dead when Nikki called his boss to ask about his life insurance policy. Now, everybody has a different way of grieving, and this doesn't necessarily mean that she was guilty of anything, but it did look a little sketchy. On top of the life insurance policy, Nikki was also trying to take out a renter's insurance policy for the burnt down house. Nikki's suspicious behavior didn't end there. Barely any time had passed since Chad's death before she ended up starting a relationship relationship with another man and moving in with him. The man's name was Earl Howard. Detectives would soon uncover that Earl and Nikki had been having an affair prior to Chad's death. They ended up bringing Nikki in for questioning. It was difficult to get information out of her. She spent a lot of time crying like this. But then, just moments later, she appeared completely fine and was even at times giggly. Listen to her burst out laughing after she gets some of the timeline confused about what she did and didn't tell law enforcement about the events leading up to Chad's death. What was the time frame on that? Oh, but we can call him. <laughs> you didn't call him? I called them. Oh, I thought you said you didn't call them. I'm like, well, are you sure? <laughs> the detective told Nikki that he knew about Earl, and he pressed her for information about what she and Earl had been up to right before Chad died. Her story was hard to follow because it was constantly changing. Tell me about, then, what you did when you showed up around 10 after 1 in the morning, you and Earl. Where? At your house. That was one long moment of silence. Clearly, Nikki hadn't thought of an answer for this, so the detectives decided to turn up the heat some more to see how she reacts. Did I forget to tell you that when you tried logging off with the camera system, it didn't actually log you off and put you in that privacy mode and kept recording? Yeah, it did. Nikki now knows that the detectives know that she was home right before Chad's death. How is she going to explain that? I went out. You went out where? Well, I was on my to get my meds. Mm -hmm. But you said that you keep your meds in your purse. I know, but I need my meds. Okay. I have a patch. Uh -huh. Okay, so tell me what happened when you guys were out there. Because it was you and Earl. It's on video. Mm -hmm. Nikki had been caught in a lie. She had previously told detectives that she always kept her meds in her purse, but now she was saying that she had to go home to get them, coincidentally, right before Chad died. Why, before you guys went out there that time to get your meds, why did you feel the need to go and try to tamper with the camera system? Mm. Yeah. You logged on at 12.43 a.m. and we're attempting to put the camera in like a privacy mode. Nikki continued to tell lie after lie after lie and keep making up stories until she did something even more bizarre. She wrote down the timeline of events leading up to Chad's death. Then when the detective reached for it, she tried to grab it back. 
Detectives pieced together that it was Earl and Nikki who worked together to kill Chad and make it look like he killed himself. Earl ended up admitting to his part in the evil plan and taking a plea deal. He was sentenced to 22 years behind bars. Nikki, however, faced trial and stood by her innocence. Nikki had told more lies than anyone could possibly keep up with, but would even one of them be enough to convince a jury that maybe she had somehow been innocent in all of this? No. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled action to make the following finding regarding the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel. Conspiracy to commit murder. As to the charge of conspiracy to commit murder, we find the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel, guilty. Conspiracy to commit arson. As to the charge of conspiracy to commit arson, we find the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel, guilty. Nikki was also found guilty of tampering with physical evidence. In court, Chad's sister was visibly emotional as she recalled the happy memories she had spent with him before his life was stolen. For the family of Chad Ensel, Friday was a day for justice. Though nothing could bring back the loss of Chad for the family, they could continue to share his spirit. People will remember my brother as a genuine great person, and I will forever remember and reminisce about the short time we got to spend with him. Chad's mother's victim impact statement was particularly hard to listen to as she expressed the pain she felt due to losing her son in such an awful way. The hurt and the pain that the loss of my son Chad is unbearable. It is a wound that will never heal. But Chad's sister said that she and the rest of her family members were not going to give Earl or Nikki the satisfaction of knowing that their cruel actions had broken them. We are not victims. We are a network of broken survivors. The family left the courtroom after the judgment. It was an emotional day all around. We are learning new information about our breaking news from last night. Nor Manquay is charged with murder and attempted murder after police say he entered his elderly neighbor's home and beat them with a metal object. On July 2nd of 2014, Nagore Maki, a young man from Iowa, forced his way into an elderly neighbor's home. Once he got inside the home, which belonged to 97-year-old Rupert Anderson and his wife Harriet, he killed him using a metal spatula and then brutally beat Harriet, nearly killing her. He had broken into the home to rob the couple, and it would later be discovered that he had picked up and moved Harriet's jewelry box, probably trying to find valuables. But oddly, after the murder was carried out and police arrived at the scene, Nagore didn't flee. He just stood outside the house looking all calm and collected. During a short encounter with McCoy on the day of the attack, outside the Andersons' home shown in this video, he told Officer Linda Powers he was there to pick up a dog as the elderly couple owned a kennel for several decades. He was so calm that initially law enforcement thought he was just an innocent witness as he was pretending to be. By him standing there calmly at the door, he didn't really catch her attention, did he? No, he did not. Law enforcement thought that maybe Nagore was a family member of the victims, but when they found out that was not the case, they knew they wanted to look into him further. That's when they learned that the murder weapon had come from his home. And when police came later that night to arrest him, McCoy's mother says he was found sleeping in bed, sweaty and wearing only underwear. She later discovered that metal spatula he allegedly used during the attack belonged to her. Nagore was arrested and charged with murder theft, and attempts to commit serious injury. During the trial, his mother, who is originally from Ethiopia, came to speak out on his behalf. She talked about the difficult life that her son had growing up. McCoy's mother took the stand for the defense today, and she explained that her son was exposed to a lot of violence growing up in an Ethiopian refugee camp. But how much of that he remembers turned out to be a complicated question. It was hard to pinpoint what exactly was the truth regarding Nagore's upbringing and what wasn't. Prosecution and defense struggled to piece together McCoy's mother's testimony, partially because of a language barrier. I don't understand the question. The other issue, her modified memory. Today, you testified that Nora was seven years old when you came to the United States. That was your testimony under oath today, wasn't it? Yes. 
But this wasn't what she had said during the first time she had talked to the prosecution. This was a problem. Prosecutors argued his age is important because that affects whether he remembers being exposed to violence while living in the refugee camp. His mother told the courtroom he lived at a group home at one point after getting involved with drugs and didn't have many friends because he would talk to himself. For some children and teens, Talking to yourself could be nothing more than an innocent habit. But was this the case for Nagor, or was there something more serious going on, like mental illness? Did it worry you that Nor talked to himself? Yes. But he was never treated for mental illness. Nagor's legal team used an insanity defense, claiming that if the young man had been treated for his mental issues, this may not have happened. Ultimately, though, it was up for the jury to decide what the truth was. They ended up deciding that Nagore was, in fact, guilty. Judge read the verdict this afternoon. Investigators say McCoy killed 97-year-old Rupert Anderson and his wife Harriet in their East Side Des Moines home in July of 2014. The insanity defense was not convincing enough for the jury or the judge. McCoy's attorney had argued an insanity defense during the trial. Today, the judge explained why he did not buy it. McCoy McCoy's family is from Ethiopia. His mother was sitting behind him in court this afternoon. McCoy did not say anything, but appeared very disappointed when the verdicts were read. Polk County Judge Jeffrey Farrell found McCoy guilty of first-degree murder, assault with intent to commit serious injury, robbery, and theft. The judge said that he believed the reason Nagore went into the Anderson home that tragic day was because he wanted to rob them, and he was prepared to do anything, even commit murder, in order to accomplish that. He said since McCoy had no income or job, he had considerable motive to commit a theft, which supported the felony murder conviction. Farrell yeah. said malice of forethought or premeditation could be inferred from use of a dangerous weapon. In this case, that was a kitchen spatula McCoy brought with him when he entered the Anderson's East Side home. At the end of the day, it was the judge who had the final word. And the only reason he would be bringing that device over to that home would be for the purpose of using it as a weapon. He wasn't going over there to cook. He wasn't going over there to grill. Um, he went over there and the first thing that he did once he got inside the house was club Rupert Anderson over the head with that spatula mul multiple times. Nagore was sentenced to life in prison for the brutal murder. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.